And at length we understood it because the constellation of Orion was identified to the god of resurrection, Osias. So this was the first breakthrough. The second breakthrough was to realize that the configuration of the three stars in Orion's belt were exactly the same as the configuration of the three pyramids of Giza. With that in mind, we had to carry on following the lead that they were giving us. And one of the major leads is that their whole effort, everything we know about pharaonic theocracy, their cult, the religion, the decrees of the king, everything they did was focused on what they called the first time, the time when their civilization began. So the next step was to see when was the beginning of the Orion cycle, and we used precession. We found out that it was in 10,500 BC. This led us to consider the whole arrangement of the sky in 10,500 BC. And we came with this absolutely amazing correlation. We found out that it was exactly at this time that the sun would rise at the vernal equinox. When we looked in that direction, we began to realize that they were drawing our attention to the direction of the alignment of the Sphinx. We have a Sphinx looking directly due east. And that is the big mystery. What does this Sphinx represent? Immediately we realized that the vernal equinox in 10,500 BC was the beginning of the age of Leo. So whether we like it or not, the science of astronomy is leading us to conclude that the Sphinx was carved in the 11th millennium. And we have to deal with that. Many ancient cultures are said to have been destroyed by cataclysmic events. Could these events be explained by the theory of crustal displacement? The Egyptians themselves tell us that their creation, their beginning, occurred after a great cataclysmic flood. Their land emerged from the waters. This date matches very well with the end of the Ice Age. It is very likely that we're looking at a civilization that has emerged from some great cataclysmic event, which in this case is probably a flood. In my opinion, this whole mystery is closely tied up and interwoven with the mystery of the last ice age, and it really is a huge mystery. Everybody knows, we all learn it at school, that there was such a thing as an ice age. And uh, it's very clearly established in the geological record that, for example, North America was covered with ice more than two miles thick, as far south as the Mississippi Delta, almost into the tropics. This ice was stable for more than 50,000 years. And then suddenly, and relatively recently, 15,000 years ago approximately, it all started to melt. And within just 2,000 years, that enormous mass of ice had completely melted down. Sea levels went up four or 500 feet around the world. No geologist has ever been able to explain why this happened, why the Ice Age ended so suddenly. But perhaps the answer lies in the theory of Earth crust displacement. Perhaps the reason that North America was covered with that mass of ice was because at that time it was situated much more closely to the North Pole than it is today. It was then shifted south into warmer latitudes by a displacement of the crust, and that would explain naturally why all that ice melted so rapidly because it was in a much warmer climate. In the early 1990s, some uh, scientists from Australia uh, discovered some beech trees uh, 200 miles from the South Pole, which they dated to be two to three million years old. That is totally un not understandable under our current assumptions about geology. Our current assumptions about geology would say that uh, to move a continent like Antarctica to a place where it could produce beech trees would require 50, 60 million years. Now these are only two to three million years. So what we're, we're facing here is the need for another uh, geological theory that could move a continent the size of Antarctica to a temperate zone under two million years. And that's where we believe the theory of Earth crust displacement comes in. If there was an Earth crust displacement, destroying most of the Earth's population, what happened to the survivors? 
after the earth crust displacement, some areas are completely unhabitable. They go into the, the frozen uh, polar zones and nobody can survive there. However, there are some areas where people can survive. Uh, they tend to be in the highlands because uh, people are afraid of, of staying in the lowlands where the tidal waves are, are devastating the, the, the shores. But in these uh, particular areas that we can isolate using the theory of uh, earth crust displacement, um, we have oases of survival. And it's precisely in those locations that we find the earliest and most important crops. And it happens not just in one area, but all around the world. It's happening in South America, it's happening in Central America, it's happening in Africa, it's happening in the Middle East, it's happening in Asia, and it's all happening around that time. There's nothing that's really much older, but suddenly, uh, after what we believe to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, of living by hunting and gathering, uh, suddenly we begin to experiment with agriculture. It seems to me that all of this is much more than coincidence. Uh, we believe that an advanced civilization was destroyed, the survivors who had knowledge of agriculture brought that knowledge to the inhabitants of the local areas that were happened to be ecologically stable and suitable for, for agriculture. And they brought that knowledge and they introduced it. And from that, we ultimately got the rebirth of civilization. It's pretty clear to me from the evidence that a common legacy of architectural knowledge was passed down from remote prehistory and spread out in very widely scattered locations around the world. Ask yourself this, if you belong to a high civilization that had just been almost completely obliterated by a gigantic geological cataclysm, a movement of the crust of the earth, what would you set out to do in the future? First of all, you would set out to create buildings that were extremely stable, that would survive the worst imaginable earthquake. And that's what we find in these fingerprints of a lost architectural knowledge all around the world. A fixation, a desire to create buildings that would last forever, no matter what happened to them. And another thing that we find is a focus on trying to predict when the cataclysm will recur. What has come down to us from the ancient past seems to be a message that by a close study of astronomical phenomena it is possible to predict when the earth will again be visited by this all-destroying cataclysm. If evolution fails to explain man's origins then what is the answer to how we came to be? For many the answer is found with a supreme being. For others, the answer may be found on another planet. I did my graduate work at Stanford and got a master's degree in communications in which I focused on science, medicine, and the environment in school. All my work in doing documentary films was in the <coughs> Stanford Medical Center and the Stanford Linear Accelerator. So when I graduated and I went on into television and production and news, all of my beats were science, medicine, and the environment. And it was in that context, in the fall of 1979, when there were reports in Canada and the United States and other parts of the world, including Australia, that animals, usually cattle, but ranging through every domestic animal, uh, were being found with strange bloodless excisions that always seemed to have kind of the same pattern from animal to animal. And I naively, at the time, thought, I will get to the bottom of this animal mutilation mystery. I was working on a documentary for Home Box Office, and a meeting had been set up and arranged by a lawyer in the East Coast with an Air Force Office, a special investigations agent named Richard C. Doty at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Kirtland is one of the United States' major weapons technology development uh, military bases. It is surrounded by very high-tech uh, laboratory and uh, high technology development, very critical area in our country. When we went up the steps and into the doors, there were several sets of doors. We went through an outer door, then we went through another set of doors. You had to check in at the desk. Then you went into a set of doors where he had to hit punch locks. And as we came into the office to sit down, one of the first things he said to me was, that documentary you did, 
referring to a strange harvest, upset some people in Washington.